Welcome back to the Hacky Neurodivergence podcast, the podcast all about people like yourself and myself uh, living life a little differently. And that differently wired brain that we both have causes challenges and unique stories. And this podcast is all about telling those stories. I'm your host, Kelsey Terry. And in today's episode, we connect with my friend Darcy and we talk about her early adolescence, we talk about navigating figuring out a major, finding your voice in school, moving across an ocean for love. And so without further ado, here's my conversation with Darcy. Welcome, Darcy. I'm excited to dig into your story today. In preparation for our conversation, it became apparent that there were essentially two themes that really came to light when we were talking. And so we're actually going to divide this conversation into two parts. Today, we'll talk about your adolescence and early career in Hawaii. And then the second part of our conversation next week will center around your career in the tech startup space. We'll then wrap up our time with a lightning round. How does that sound, Darcy? Sounds wonderful. Okay. With that, we'll start off with an easy question. Where are you located and what keeps you busy these days? I live outside of Seattle, Washington, and most days what keeps me busy is working in product operations for a small climate startup that works in decarbonization and carbon accounting. Tell me about elementary school and middle school Darcy. What was that like? I think uh, it became very apparent quite early on that I uh, was labeled as shy. I was I avoided talking to most people. In fact, uh, I have an older sister who I use to relay information to the world with her help. And so I would whisper into her ear and then she would serve as my voice. And so a lot of elementary school and middle school was trying to it really be pushed to come out of that pattern. With some success, what's the age difference between you and your sister? We are 18 months apart and we are night and day. She is blonde, I'm brunette-ish, and people our whole lives have always really seen like the dichotomy between the two of us where she's more bubbly and outgoing and I've always been more of the shy reserved one. There had to have been moments or seasons where she was in like middle school and you were stuck in elementary school. So how did you fare without her, given the age difference between the two of you? Yeah, it did have been in a transition between elementary, middle school, and high school that there would always be one year where she was not present. And so I certainly felt like one of those kids that had my best friend was, was born into my family. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I really relied on her friendship and presence to guide me socially. And that year that she was never that she wasn't there because of she transitioned to the, the grade above me, I, I, really, I really suffered in a lot of ways because I didn't have the skills to make my own connection. I always relied upon her friend group. And so I was always brought in as like the, the third wheel or the fourth, fourth wheel. I was like, oh, this is, this is, this is uh, Kelly's sister, Darcy. And then those became my friends. But it was also helpful in some ways because mm-hmm. I'm, my time, for example, when I went to uh, high school, she already had a fledgling uh, friend group and I just inserted myself right in there. And that same pattern repeated all the way through college. So then for that year where she was on to the next school, did you keep to yourself? Did you gravitate more to your teachers? What did that year look like when Darcy was running solo with her sister in the next school? I think a a good mixture. I would often keep to myself. I would uh, do a lot of art, spend time in the library with my teachers, you know, always trying to dread the, you know, the school cafeteria (laughs) moments where you don't have anyone to stay with. I ultimately did end up making my own, my own friends, but it never felt as safe and lasting as it did with adhering myself to my sister's friend group. So I know we're we're talking about elementary, middle school, high school, but I'm curious, what's the relationship that you have with your sister today? Are you still close? Is she still your voice? Or what does that look like as adults? That is a good question. I would say that, you know, we are still very close. She's still the person that I identify as my best friend. I think that there was a period 
post-college where our lives went separate ways. We pursued different careers. We pursued different, even just physical locations that we were living in. And a lot of, a lot of my early twenties were, were really spent in a lot of internal reflection of trying to separate myself from my sister and really formulating my own identity and who I was. And I think probably the same experience slightly for her, but certainly not to the same degree where for me, it was always, this is Darcy Kelly. And for her, it was Lois and Kelly and she had her own identity. So yeah, I think that my early twenties ended up being a lot, maybe potentially a lot harder than the average 20, 20 experience because not only was I trying to find a career, I was also trying to find my own distinct identity as well. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that happens to everyone, right? Just at different stages in life of like, who am I and what do I actually care about? And so any advice for someone that might be going through that season right now? I think it's really just celebrating what makes you different from your sibling, finding your own interests, not being ashamed of those interests, really just being being bold and trying new things, even if, it, even if it means going solo, because you'll never know who you'll meet there. And I've been very fortunate that I've met, met and made a lot of friends in the moments where I did something my sister couldn't do with me and push myself. For example, when I was in college, I studied abroad. My sister did not come along. And I met a lot of amazing people in there. And I also really started to grasp who I was as an individual separate from my sister who had always been that voice for me. I love that. So let's move on to college, right? So you've left the nest. You are trying to figure out who you are. You mentioned you studied abroad. Tell me about the college era of Darcy. I think the college era was very similar, unfortunately, to the elementary and middle school era. Of really just not knowing who I was. I think college is a very social time where you push boundaries. And I never felt comfortable to live on campus. Again, like I set myself up in a situation where my sister was there. We lived in an in a apartment off campus and I hung out with her. And so it really limited my social interaction in a lot of ways. Um, that ultimately ended up changing when I joined a sorority again. Um, I'm surprised here because my sister joined. And so you can kind of say this pattern continued throughout college. But then, you know, you're in your major and you meet friends that, you know, who are in that major. And so with that and studying abroad, like it's as, you know, by the time I got to my senior year, I really started to have a stronger, again, identity. What was your major and then what was your sister's major? I'm curious. Did you follow the same path or to how much did you diverge? <laughs> We did not. My major was in art and my sister was doing nursing at the time. So very different. And I think that's where you started to see me push further and further away from my family in my 20s because so, much, so many of my family is in, is in healthcare that I was like, I, that's not for me. I wanted, I want to march the beat of my own drum. I'm finding myself. I'm going to do something completely different. I chose art. It ultimately isn't what I do for a living or or did for a living, but it was a really enjoyable experience that gave me that sort of identity. You have a family that's in medicine of one form or the other. Tell me more about that moment where you're like, you know what, I'm going to go do art, which is like fundamentally different, right, than the traditional sciences. Was that met with you know, pushback. How did you navigate that as someone that really was very, very close to and almost like their sister's shadow? How did you navigate that? Or was it very easy of like, I know I'm going to do something different because this is what the rest of my family has done. I'm curious how you made a shift in that behavior relative to your upbringing. Yeah, I think for me, so in high school, I, I did focus a lot on the sciences. and I thought I wanted to go into engineering and you know, I I got pretty decent grades in high school, but in the transition to college, I realized what came to me easily in high school did not come to me easily in college. I was really chasing joy at that period. I was on a period of my life where I was, you know, 
you know, I guess from from middle school, mm -hmm. I was aware of the concept that I felt depressed and more depressed than my peers, perhaps. And so I distinctly remember not feeling happy from about 11 years old on. And of course, that fluctuated throughout my life. I mean, it, it certainly was very cyclical, but it, it kind of reached its head during my freshman year of college. And in that depression and anxiety of failing and struggling in classes for the first time in a long time, of not having... So again, once again, finding myself in a situation where I don't have a social identity separate from my sister, I've moved away from my family, and I've gone to college out of state besides my sister. It all came to a head where my depression and anxiety were, were through the roof, and I just wanted to chase and find joy. And art had always been a safe outlet for me. And at the time, you know, being 18, 19 years old, you just think, I need to get through this. Not what does this look like 10, five, 10 years from now for a career? And so I wasn't really thinking of the financial viability of art as a career. I was just thinking, this is what I like to do now and I will feel safe and happy there. And that's what I need. So with that, you go from engineering into art, but then you ended up in Hawaii. Tell me about how one <laughs> goes from art to Hawaii, fill in the little, the pieces there. Yeah, uh, again, hate that. You can see the patterns here. Uh, really just me trying to struggle and figure out where I belong and where I fit in. And so I graduated with a degree in art, with a specialization in art degree. Uh, I thought I want to be, I really wanted to be a curator. I really wanted to work in museums. I'd done my internship abroad in Florida, Italy. And in doing so, Although I have a thriving career elsewhere in the world, in the United States, it is very, very challenging to, as a field, to break into. And I think you had to, like, the message became very clear in hindsight that I would have had gone to more of an Ivy League school, certainly not the small state that I went to in Oregon, in order to be at the echelon that I needed to be to achieve one of those jobs. And I didn't know anyone in the field. I didn't have any connections. Nobody really was there to open those doors for me. And so I just got rejection after rejection after rejection of grad school because I did need an advanced degree in art history to take on that next level. And so it was a real, it was a real eye-opening eye experience mm -hmm. that I feel like, you know, you don't really, you don't really prepare and understand. And so. You know, I thought, well, what, what else do I like to do? What, what else like rings true to my values? And when I had studied abroad in Italy, one of the things that I had spent a lot of time doing was language exchange. So learning, working to learn Italian and helping somebody with their English. And it was such a positive experience for me because it helped me make friends in Italy in a much easier way than Again, I've naturally never had that talent to do that. And so I came back and I thought, well, again, once again, that was a bad experience. So let's go see where that leads. And so ultimately went back to school and I got my master's in education specifically on language and language development. And so it was a, once again, another pivot, but I feel very fortunate that uh, I had had that experience that led me in that direction because. I truly didn't know what to do in that moment. So if someone finds themselves in that place, right, where a major doesn't work out or a career doesn't work out, what advice would you give to someone that finds themselves, you know, what can what feel like a brick wall, right, that's in front of them? Yeah, what would you say to someone that might find themselves in a similar place this today? You know, I think... <laughs> I think the perception out there is that, you know, you're supposed to pick a major at 18 and proceed forward down that path. And that's what you're going to do. And, you know, I just don't think that matches the reality of the workforce to, the, to this day. I think that there's a lot of flexibility to pivot and that pivoting can be taken. Like, I think that it can be perceived as a character flaw, but I really, truly don't think that it is. It, I think it's recognizing that, like, the odds are not stacked in your favor. I'm going to go play a winnable game. 
I'm going to go find a place where I'm wanted, where I'm desired, where I can continue to flourish. If all the doors are closing on me, yes, I can push through. Yes, I can break down those doors. But I think it's okay to tell yourself that there is another door over there. And if I walk through that door, who knows where life's going to take me. And I really experienced that with myself. I think I pivoted more, more than perhaps I would want to. And to be honest, it feels like there's almost a level of, of shame that comes with that. Like it, it feels like a shameful thing to have bounced around so much that, again, maybe that's a character flaw, but I truly don't believe that it is because I think what I'm proud of is that I never, I never gave up or I never, I never had one, like, I must do X to be happy. Like I saw that I could do X, Y, or Z to be happy. But what mattered to me was that I was happy. I love that. I think while, you know, in social circles, we might say, oh, I, I pivoted from X to Y. The way I would reframe that is I would say, I am resilient, Me meaning that like you could flourish, you could find happiness, meaning and progress in a whole collection of places. It could be making focaccia bread. It could be doing yeah. art and, and looking at Ugly Jesus in Italy, inside joke. <laughs> they baked well, Ugly <laughs> Baby Jesus. <laughs> ugly Baby Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Renaissance paintings, for those that are unaware. And, and so I think that that is truly the way to find happiness in a modern context is to, I don't know, embrace a level of resilience. Because if you have that rigidity of I must do X and that's the only way I can be happy, that is a surefire formula for misery. And so it sounds like right. you were discovering that at a younger age than maybe others. Right. And I think too, all too often, you truly just don't know, right? Like, and I think that that's, that's the part that 18, 19 year old version of myself didn't understand is that it seemed like, oh, if I just go get this four-year college degree, that equates to success. Or even if I did get that job, that I would flourish in that job. Certainly, like all that's blocking me is just getting that job. But as you and I are both aware, just because simply you have a job doesn't mean that it works for you, for who you are, for your daily, your daily patterns and habits and your brain. Mm -hmm. So um, those are things that no, no college pamphlet or college, you know, like <laughs> no online quiz could tell you. That like, here's what this job actually looks like. Here's what your, you know, your average Tuesday is going to be like. And will it work for you? So, yeah. You go from engineering to art into education. You go back to school where you've had some success yeah. there. Tell me about what happens after you leave college or leave your master's, I should say. Yeah. So in that time period, I had met, you know, husband and he... This was 2008, 2009. So the economy is not, not doing well. There are limited job opportunities for new grads, himself and myself. And one of the offers that he got was in Hawaii. And so he picked up and, and moved for the opportunity to get his first big job. And I finished, I was in the process of finishing up my grad school. And we knew we wanted to be together and take the next step. And so I relocated there to, to be with him. How, how did that go? Like, was that <laughs> nerve wracking, you know, moving across the country and I don't know how many hours across the ocean to a little island of Hawaii. Tell me a little bit, like, what was going through your head or the emotions like, right? You take this leap of faith to follow someone that you deeply care about. And now you're married to take us to that moment and tell us a little bit more. Well, it certainly was about, you know, I'd lived in Italy. And so I was used to being at that point, I had really stretched and grown those muscles of, of independent, the independent version of myself and what they look like. And so Hawaii, although was away from my sister, my family, it we didn't feel like I couldn't do it because I had proved that I could do it. Where the difficulty came from was you know, I hadn't, I didn't have a job, I, you know, like, so I just finished grad school. And so there's a lot of conversations between myself and my now husband of let's make this work. I'm moving over there. 
it's very expensive. We are now roommates. I cannot afford to live by myself. And so we we went from, you know, dating to living together by necessity for that situation. And so it, it, was, it was a very conscious decision to, to, to decide to be together, but it certainly was zero to 90. So I, I would love to highlight the lesson in that. And the lesson I would like to call out and emphasize is the idea that you had confidence, some, some amount of confidence to go to Hawaii because Italy, like you had survived Italy. You had lived through it. You found out that you didn't die. It worked out and you had a blast in Italy. And I think that's a lesson for so many of us that are neurodivergent when we're unsure about trying a new food, going to a new city or, you know, changing a career. It's like, is this going to work? And sometimes we don't even have the evidence ourselves in our own lives that we will be successful, that we will survive. But we can take stories like Darcy's and say, you know what? It worked for her. Maybe it could work for me. And so that's just one lesson I want to really pull out and emphasize that if you're in those moments where you're not sure that something could work out, either look to your own life, try to find other examples, or look at the examples of other people's lives and say, hey, maybe it could work for me too. So thank yeah, you for sharing I, that. I thank you. I think I was in a lot of situations where the risk reward was, was very high, right? Like there was no, uh, it was very risky, but I knew that the, the potential payoff was falling in love and being with the person who was my best friend and the person I definitely wanted to be in a relationship with. So you're in Hawaii. Tell me what you ended up doing. Yeah, so I ended up trying a few different things, but I ultimately landed on a career um, managing a, a portion of a literacy nonprofit. So working with adults in Hawaii who needed help uh, with their reading and writing skills. And so I think at the time, Hawaii, one out of four adults um, struggled with, with reading and writing. And so we offered free tutoring um, services to anybody in need. Looking back at that time, what neurodivergent things did you see existing in some of those adults? Yeah, I think for, for a lot of adults who have reading and writing challenges, a lot of them experience undiagnosed learning disabilities, dyslexia. A lot of times their parents themselves struggled with reading and writing. So it was inherited in, so in, in a sense. A lot of times they were facing things like homelessness, food scarcity, poverty. There are a lot of things that can ultimately impact somebody's educational development. And so... In many ways, in doing this nonprofit work, we would be addressing, you know, helping them with their reading and writing and, and getting their skills to a place where they can thrive. But we simply couldn't just treat that because oftentimes they, they needed a lot of support in other ways. They needed help applying for jobs, finding housing, helping their kids enroll in school. So illiteracy ultimately impacted much of their day-to-day -day life. And so you found that your goal and your mission, like the parameters of it, really stretched beyond literacy. And it was overall just coming alongside these individuals and helping them get from one place to another to help hopefully improve their economic circumstances. Exactly. So let's fast forward to there's a decision that causes you to ultimately leave Hawaii and come back to the mainland. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so at that time, my husband and I had gotten married and we were looking at starting our own family. You know, I, we had been at that, we've been in Hawaii at that point for six or seven years. And I think this is a very like textbook experience for people originally from the mainland is that, you know, you, you miss your, your friends and family. Yes, you have often made new friends and family on the islands themselves, but Hawaii can be a very transient place. And so we have a lot of friends come and go throughout our time period there. So 
it it sort of reached a point where it felt like we were we were homesick in many ways, although Hawaii had become our home, and that it was time to go home. I will also say that there, in part of my work for with the nonprofit, I was working with a lot of populations that were really suffering suffering as the result of gentrification of a mass influx of people not native to Hawaii or local to Hawaii and being priced out of their home. And I got to a point where I no longer felt comfortable living there, having this idyllic paired, like when people think of, of Hawaii and life in Hawaii, your friends and family like, oh, I would spend every day at the beach. And we really didn't. It really was like living anywhere else. You know, we go to Costco, we go to the movies, we go to the gym, we go to the dentist. Like it really was just normal life. I just happened to be on an island. But in my work, I'm traveling across all the different islands, helping individuals. And just, I, yeah, I just felt like I was a part of the problem rather than the solution in that sense. Uh, like no matter how much literacy work I did, I was still a part of uh, a population of people that were coming over and pricing out locals out of their homes. I'm curious to hear your perspective around tourism in Hawaii. And so how would you, if someone wants to go to visit Hawaii, is there any advice that you might give someone in terms of like what you just highlighted in terms of people being priced out? Or would you encourage people to actively avoid the islands? Tell me your thoughts on tourism in Hawaii. I think that there's a lot of a lot of people from Hawaii who have been very vocal that they are asking people not from Hawaii to stay home due to due to this problem, due mm-hmm. to the housing prices, due to the water shortages, and for a lot of a lot of reasons. And so I would defer to them. I think that ultimately a lot of the people in Hawaii are asking tourists not to come. I think that the the state of Hawaii is very dependent upon tourist dollars. So it is a very difficult, complicated situation. But like there are a lot of local experts speaking to what the needs are of Hawaii and the the consequences of over-tourism. Sure. So looking back and, you know, following someone for love, obviously it worked out for you. If someone else were in a similar position, what would you encourage them to make sure to do? Like, how would you do this well, knowing what you know now of like following someone to a new place? And what should they be careful to avoid? I think really, really, uh, again, like avoid those same common pitfalls that you have been experiencing in other relationships in your life, because those same patterns and pitfalls will happen within your relationship. And so I found myself in Hawaii. My husband had been there for about a year before I got there. He had found a community. He is absolutely incredibly outgoing and just really sociable. And so I once again found myself in a situation where somebody could had done the legwork, could do the legwork. It, I think, and it's very clear it comes much easier to him than it does to me in a lot of ways. And so... I found myself in that same situation where I tried to just become friends with his friends. And at times it often felt very isolating as well because I didn't have my own community in, in Hawaii. Sure, I had some coworkers that were wonderful and fantastic that took me under their wing and made me feel welcome. But I never truly had my own group of friends that weren't my husband's friends first. Over the arc of our conversation, a couple of themes have come through. You were hyper connected with your sister and found a means to connect with your other peers through her. And then once again in Hawaii through David. Looking back at your life, we'll say from birth to leaving Hawaii, how would you say neurodivergence showed up in your life? Yeah, I think that I think it's there in the, in those stories. And I think that it really came to a head. Uh, in re- in meeting my husband David and seeing him interact in Hawaii and also in college, we were in college together, because conversations always became so natural to him. He connected with people easy, and in watching him communicate with others, it it felt almost like a scientist in some ways because I was 
or I was studying him, watching him interact with strangers. And he would make these incredibly deep and strong connections with people almost instantly. And so I found myself doing is I would hear him say a question to somebody and rather than I I would almost like make a mental note of, well, that's a great question to ask somebody. Let me try that sometime. And so I think that I guess to answer your question is like, it's always been something in my life that I've always felt neurologically different than others, felt separated from my peers. But it wasn't until I was an adult and had been exposed to a variety of different individuals across the world that I realized everyone operates a little bit differently, but you have been exposed to so many different people and cultures that you can take the best of it. (laughs) You can study it like a scientist and you can ingest it and you can practice and you can push yourself and you can get better at, 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 at the social, the social aspect, I guess. I could agree more. I found myself trying to, and I think successfully, befriending very, very popular people, people that were either very popular or very, very smart or very, very beautiful. They, they all skewed one way or another. And I actually have a whole episode on this called Learning to Love Your Monsters. But I I gravitated towards those people and then I would like replicate at a robotic level what they were doing because I saw it was like, this clearly is working. Like it's working. (laughs) Like men throw themselves at this person's feet. That would be great as a single woman. (laughs) And so it's interesting to see some of those similarities, right? When you find that playbook or you find almost like a loving ambassador in the form of your sister and now your husband. And then you get to try those things out for yourself and see like, okay, does this form of small talk work? Does this type of eye contact or this handshake resonate with people? And I think that's something that neurotypical to people don't appreciate enough and is just like how much practice and intentionality can go into those interactions and the level of study that can result as we try to fit in with our peers and family. Yeah, exactly. I think that, you know, when I first joined in Hawaii, I was I was working in inside the classroom and there there was a distinct moment where I would cut like I would come home from work and I would just be absolutely exhausted. And I'd had other peers that would teach and they would be rejuvenated or hmm. you know, like not to say that teachers, you know, and educators don't get tired at the end of the day. Absolutely one hundred percent that is the case. It's very hard work. But I would come home and, you know, I think that's where being in a relationship with somebody who wasn't born or, you know, wasn't, didn't grow up with you, wasn't born, you know, with you, that it became apparent to me because my husband would say things like, it's like you're a shell, you know, like you're not really here, you know, like I really just need a lot of time to decompress. And I realized that I was acting when I was teaching. I wasn't just teaching. I was also going through the motion of having to act to be super engaging and connecting with my students. And it was like I was putting on this different persona of how I thought a teacher should be on top of actually doing the teaching as well. And so it almost felt like that old adage of like, I don't know, was it Fred Astaire and Jen? Oh, man, I'm going to get this wrong. But here they the big like, quote of like, was it Ginger Rogers? Somewhere, anyways, like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, she was saying, like, I'm as good of a dancer as him, basically, because I have to do everything he does, but backwards, right? And mm-hmm. so it felt a little bit like that. Like, I had to not only do the teaching as well as other teacher, I had to also act that as well. The masking can be very, very exhausting. And especially with loved ones, when you can take that mask off, you feel safe enough to unmask and stop acting the exhaustion that, you know, our loved ones get to observe in us and they're like, oh, gosh, like, couldn't you be normal like you were two hours ago? <laughs> I've never heard that quote before, but it, it definitely look, makes sense. Look, I, I did not get that right. And I'll please look it up. But I think that that's often how I that's as soon as I, you know, got out of college and got that close contact with the loved one who again didn't grow mm-hmm. with me. That's what I started. He started pointing out to these things that I just assumed were just how everyone felt 
And well, I think a lot of people feel that way. I, I don't think it's true for everyone. And so like, oh, there's, <laughs> you might be onto something there. So with regards to next week's session, we're going to go and talk about your more recent life in the tech space and doing product management, product ops. And we're going to do a deep dive on thriving in the midst of ambiguity and, again, startup craziness. So we're going to do a deep dive on that. But for today's session, we're going to wrap things up with our lightning round. Are you ready, Darcy? I am ready. ka -chow. Ka -chow, ka -chow, ka -chow. For those that are not aware, Darcy and I are best friends. And so <laughs> this is just a blast. This has been a blast of a conversation. Okay, so what is your favorite book to tell other people about? I had to think long and hard about this one because I think there's only one book that I tell I I tell people to read because well, I'll just say the title of the book. It is Evicted by Matthew Desmond. I might get that wrong, but it came out in 2016. I think I read it the same year it came out. It's just after uh, we have relocated from Hawaii, where again, I had experienced, you know, going into uh, transitional shelters, homeless encampments with my students. And there would be, you know, 50% of the population were under the age of five and experiencing homelessness. And this book, In Evicted, Matthew Desmond, the author, he talks about poverty within the United States and he talks about a lot of the the consequences of of being unhoused, of homelessness, and the systems in place or the cycles that can be repeated in the systems that are in place that really hinder and harm people in the United States as people um, experience poverty. You should check it out. I think that you cannot read it and. Well, I you know the United States is currently, I mean, a lot of the world, but a lot of the mm -hmm. United States is currently experiencing a housing crisis. And I think that that book is a must read to really understand how we got to this um, place and how, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a heavy read. You know, it won't, mm -hmm. it won't leave you with a lot of optimism, but I think it's a read that should be required because it really will open your eyes to what people are currently experiencing and facing. What's a playlist or artist you keep on repeat? This year has been, for me, the year of Hosier. He had a new album come out called Unreal Unearth. If you haven't listened to it, I don't know why I'm plugging it. It's a phenomenal. But I highly recommend checking that out. And then, as you mentioned, we are besties. And we did go to the Eras tour together. And so it's also been, I think, we can all say this. It's Taylor Swift's year as well. So this year was the year of really embracing my 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 Swift Tdom, my Swiftiness. I don't know, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, and for those that don't know you, Darcy, what is what era of Taylor Swift do you identify with most? Yeah, this is such a great question. This is the best question you've asked. <laughs> it's not the other questions were great. You know, I live in the Pacific Northwest, and I think it'd be really hard not to say either Evermore or Folklore. Like, it just, it feels like it has to be one of them. So. Oh, I thought you were going to say Reputation. But <laughs> but I, I think, like, in terms of where you live, yes, that is the, the appropriate album. We were at the Seattle show, and we caused an earthquake. That's my, my one of my bragging rights for the rest of my life is, like, I was part of yeah. this great 50-quake. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Next up, what is your favorite neurodivergent related purchase? Like a thing that you have bought because you have a differently wired brain that helps you. I don't have an answer here other than couple counseling. Like <laughs> that is the best money <laughs> I have ever spent. I think that, you know, helping my husband understand the way that my brain works mm -hmm. and also, I mean, equally understanding the way his does as well mm -hmm. and really having those hard conversations about the things that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis of what's happening, how we're unintentionally communicating the wrong things, how we're unintentionally offending one another, holding grudges, whatever that may be as a result of just who we are as individuals. 
That is the best money I have ever spent. And I think our marriage is thriving today is because we did do and have done done that work. And not to spare not just for people who are coupled. Obviously, I think that there is a lot of worthy investment for for therapy. That's my therapy plug. Okay. I receive your therapy plug. I am also pro therapy. Next question is when you're flooded or feeling overwhelmed, what's a way, what's a mechanism that you use to help like self-regulate when you're overwhelmed? I think music is certainly one of them. I have two dogs. I like to take them for walks. I've done yoga on and off in my life as a way to reconnect and recenter. And then the honesty I did besides those very nice to say answers, the real real answer is the 2005 version of Pride and Prejudice. I put that on when I am just having a rough day where I need to reset. And it is my comfort movie of all comfort movies. So yeah, I'm also plugging the 2005 Pride and Prejudice. It really helps me. It really helps me feel at peace. I love that. Um, And we watched that together this summer, and I feel like I had a new appreciation for it after watching it with you, hearing you quote the whole thing. But that was good. You were you were actually very, very restrained, despite your your encyclopedic knowledge of the film. Yeah. Mr. Darcy. Carefully my poor setup. (laughs) You did. No. You you know what? You did. It was fine. It was great. It was then Twilight. We went to Fort Washington. <laughs> that <laughs> so, is true. And then we saw just how bad Twilight was as like some people in our mid thirties and like, oh my gosh, this was a moment in I'm American history. To like that. <laughs> okay. Next up, what is advice that you would give to your younger self? We'll say circa age 16, 15, 16. What would you what advice would you give? I think what every 16 year old needs to hear is like it doesn't matter (laughs) this is going to be very like existentialist is that what it is i don't know what it is Mm -hmm. like none of it matters like it just doesn't matter how many friends you have if you're popular if you have a boyfriend a girlfriend the size of your bra like none of it matters because ultimately at the end of the day you can go you can graduate school and go off to college or a career or whatever you'd want to do. Uh, get married, stay single, have kids, don't have kids. Like ultimately, it is your life, and you get to dictate what happiness and how you're, uh, what is happiness, and how you're going to define and achieve success. I think that I felt very brainwashed into a concept of what success was, and so much of my. 30s and as I approach 40 is really just like stripping back into that programming in a sense and being happy and celebrating the things that actually make me happy versus what society tells me should make me happy. On a related note, I'm curious, what is the best advice that you've been given? Uh, Probably the best advice that I've ever been given was you cannot heal in a place that is harming you. And this has become really important to me as I work through tech, given that working for small startup organizations can be a very fast-paced, oftentimes toxic environment that can really, really be hard for even neurotypical individuals that You really need to protect yourself and constantly check in about how am I doing? What do I need? And no matter how many different compensation strategies you have, techniques, prior, whatever they, whatever they may be, at the end of the day, you're, you have to protect yourself and your well being, your mental health, your relationships. And sometimes you may find yourself in a place where a job, is a me is certainly a financial means to an end, but it could be doing more harm to you than than good. And while some individuals can do the work and heal within that environment, that harmful environment, 
if you have tried everything and you cannot, there is no shame in advocating for yourself and removing yourself from a harmful situation. Well, that sounds like a movie trailer for our next episode. So stay tuned next week where we do a deep dive on a career in tech and trying to navigate that space, which is already challenging to navigate. And again, Darcy did a great job teeing up next week's episode. So please stay tuned. Hit subscribe if you want to be notified when that episode drops. And with that, thank you for connecting with us today, Darcy. Thank you, Darcy. That was fun. Wasn't that a fantastic conversation? I can't wait for you to hear part two where we focus in on the last five years or so of Darcy's life. And we really press in around what it means to pursue healing, how to raise your hand and ask for help, how to navigate that conversation with your manager, all those things and more will happen next week. So look forward to catching you then. We'll talk soon.